most secure shelter in this world. I'm very much attached to family life and worldly activities, and I'm blind to spiritual knowledge. So please tell me, how can I advance in spiritual life? You have said that I'm not fatigued by labor because the soul is different from the body. However, pain and pleasure are certainly felt by the soul. Just like if you take a pot of milk and rice and eat it, then both become heated simultaneously. So, in the same way, bodily pains and pleasures are certainly felt by the mind, senses, and soul. How can the soul be completely free from this conditioning? I don't understand. My dear King, you are, you are, although you are not experienced at all, you are speaking as if you are a learned man. The relationship between the master and the servant and material pains and pleasures are all simply external. When a person wakes up, everything he dreamt is forgotten. It is false. Similarly, one eventually realizes that taking birth on this planet or in the higher planets as a human being, as a demigod, as an animal or bird, all these things only bring insignificant material happiness. According to the consciousness of the mind, one takes birth in higher or lower species. When the mind is contaminated by the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance, it is simply like an independent, uncontrolled elephant absorbed in sense gratification and causing endless suffering. Due to the false ego, absorbed in the illusion of I, me and mine, the mind becomes affected by disease, lamentation, attachment, illusion, greed and enmity. And thus, one becomes more and more entangled in the material world. However, when the mind becomes unattached, the mind becomes the cause of liberation. When the flame of the lamp lights the wick improperly, the wick becomes blackened. However, when it is filled with heat, the lamp shines brightly. Similarly, when the mind is absorbed in material sense gratification, it only brings suffering. But when it is uh, unattached, it brings about the joy and brilliance of Krishna consciousness. The uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If we neglect it, it will become more and more powerful and become victorious. <laughs> Although it is not factual, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the living entity. The Supreme Lord Narayan is full of all potencies. He is the all-pervading cause of the whole creation and the shelter for all living entities. By his potency, he resides in the hearts of all, directing the wanderings of all living entities. King Raghunana then went on to ask more and more questions. Jadavarat instructed him 
on the futility of material enjoyment and the prime necessity of engaging in devotional service to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. He then went on to tell him about his own path to self-realization throughout his three previous births and how he was liberated from the clutches of Maya. My dear King Rabugana, you are a victim of the external energy. I advise you that you should at once give up your kingly position and your attachment to sense objects with the sword of transcendental knowledge and devotional service to the spiritual master and to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then you will be able to cut the knot of material attachment and cross over this ocean of material nations. This birth as a human being is the best of all. <coughs> what is the use of an exalted position of a demigod if there is no possibility of associating with pure devotees? Just by being covered by the dust of your lotus feet, one is immediately gets pure devotional service to a doctor. By associating with you, simply for one moment, I have become free from all doubts and false prestige, which are the root of all entanglement in this material. I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the great personalities, whether they wander on this earth as children, young boys, abadus, or learned brahmanas. By their mercy, may there be good fortune for the royal dynasties who are always offending them. Maharaj Rahugana had been bitten by the serpent of ignorance, but was cured by the nectarian words of his saintly personality, Jadavarat. He thus gave up his bodily conception of life and became completely self-realized. Jadavarat then began to wander freely all over the earth, just as before, absorbed in thoughts of the Supreme Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Um, I want to thank 
and on behalf of Srila Gurudev, we want to thank uh, this many important people that have played a very, very important role here in organizing and making this festival a success. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, thank the cooking department headed by Lakshman Das. Everybody will go back home uh, taking very fond memories of the delicious prasadam that has been offered by Lakshman Prabhu. And also his team, and also his team, uh, he, he has been uh, also offered uh, an invitation to go to other festivals to uh, be a uh, head cook there. <laughs> Within uh, uh, his deputy is Amal Krishna Prabhu and Nakawal Prabhu. And uh, the other team that was helping Lakshman Prabhu also was uh, Balaram Prabhu. And the family, Raghunath and family. Please, uh, well, once you can stand up, it would be nice. And also, Charumuki. And also, Charumuki and Dilawati. So, um, and also a few others that has been also helping uh, in this whole Prashadam area. So, on behalf of Sula Gurudev, he wants to thank the whole team. And also, one more, one more person was uh, Murali uh, Raman Bihari Prabhu and his wife. Please stand up. Raman Bihari and The next area is um, I want to thank a uh, very very important area also in where she had gone all the way so much to handle all people's requests in accommodation and uh, getting many calls from all over the world and also from local, she had uh, had to be so much patient. And we want to thank Krishna Priya Dasi. And uh, just to inform that she also took charge of handling the transportation for devotees to come here and for back to Kuala Lumpur and also some ground arrangements. And uh, she single-handedly handled this whole area of accommodation and transport. So thank you. Very much. <laughs> Moving on to the next area, as we can see, the very beautiful uh, decoration that has been laid out here uh, with the Yasa Sun and also the altar and all flower and decoration arrangements um, was done by Savitri Didi. So please do I have. We have Savitri Didi And also, not forgetting, not. Yeah, Gurudev wants you to stand up. And also, not forgetting the backbone of Savitri Didi is Nanda Prabhu. has been
Nanda Prabhu has been uh, very kind and very generous in um, assisting us in this whole festival. Um, from the beginning, we had gone to many resorts and many places and uh, he had accompanied me to all these places and we want to thank him so much for his contribution for this festival. Thank you. And moving on to the next area is uh, Bala Krishna Prabhu. Sound and light. from Kuala Lumpur and uh, many uh, arrangements has been made to bring all this uh, sound and light system so and also he has been partly involved in the drama play uh, being the man behind this whole drama so please give a hand to Um, not forgetting, this whole festival is also broadcast live uh, throughout the world and he has also been assisting in, in this whole broadcast because Shamri, Shamra and Didi's uh, is, uh, team or is, um, is also is the main person, person Mahaprabhu and uh, Vashanti Isa Prabhu, that who has been involved in this whole live broadcasting around the world. So we want to thank the team. And also, we had a very great festival on the uh, 24th of this month, uh, the Shobha Yatra festival that was held in Johor Bahru. We had a very uh, wonderful event there. So many people had turned out. Uh, he had brought in all the public and also some politicians coming to this festival, organizing dance, dance performance, organizing this whole Shobayatra card procession, um, organizing this, uh, uh, this card where uh, Jagannath Baldev and Subhadra and Shila Prabhupada and Shila Gurudev was taken in this whole vicinity of uh, Skudai Baru. So we want to thank him. Uh, person is Ram Vijay Prabhu. So finally, we want to thank Srila Gurudev for coming here and helping giving us this opportunity to serve this festival. Oh, also now with Par Parikrama it is very near us, about one month. So I am inviting you all, if no money problem or any other problem, you should try to come to Nobati for seven days. Go Prama! I want to thank two personalities who has given us this opportunity so much for all these years, for the last 13 years, that none other than Rajanath Prabhu and Madhav Maharaj. Day of classes and last day of Srila Gurudev's external association for some time. We'll be speaking about the importance of association, um, physical association, uh, and spiritual association with pure devotees. Also, the importance of chanting. The Hare Krishna Mantra. 
for the various other prayers and mantras for attainment of love for Krishna and Radha and Guru. So we'll be discussing from the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Another important aspect of this discussion will be not only the importance of chanting in relation to our own uh, development of bhakti, but the importance of giving that chanting to others. As Srila Prabhupada said about his own books, that they are recorded kirtan. Vyasadeva dictated, Ganesh took the dictation, or Sukadeva was speaking to uh, Purikit Maharaj, that was dictated. Srila Rupa Goswami wrote some prayers that was translated. So this is also kirtan and giving kirtan and taking kirtan. So Srimad Bhagavatam has many, ten subject matters throughout the ten cantos or twelve cantos. One is uh, the creation, the sub-creation, creation by Mahavishnu, sub-creation by Brahma, the different planetary systems, the attainment of the heavenly planetary systems, the uh, descent to the hellish planets, and various uh, incarnations of the Lord. Parikit Maharaj told Sukadeva Goswami at the beginning of the sixth canto, now you've told me about the creation, the sub-creation, the demigods, the different planetary systems, and the last thing you told me was about the various hellish planets. In the fifth canto, Srila Sukadeva Goswami has described different hells called uh, Rurava, Vaitarani, and many others. There are 28 main hells. For example, if a Brahmana disregards his regulative principles and drinks liquor, then he has to go to a specific hell where he's forced by the constables of the god of death to drink hot molten iron. And the problem is, if he could just die and start again in his next life, that would be not so bad. But just as we have a subtle body and a gross body, and the gross body dies, and the subtle body takes us to another body, so there's another subtle body on top of that one. Not the physical body, but a subtle body on top of the mind that we have that everyone who goes to hell has to get. So you suffer, and it's just like suffering with a gross physical body. But the problem is you can't die. It just goes on for years, drinking this hot molten iron. Another, in another hellish planet, one who's had, uh, who has and is attached to illicit sex with the opposite sex, has to, is forced by the Yamadutas to tightly embrace a statue of that opposite sex that's made of hot iron. You know, if you touch hot iron, immediately it's excruciating, you pull your finger back. Imagine if you have to embrace that for years and years. And at the same time, on top of all that, the constables of Yamaraj whip that person while he's embracing. Another one, if somebody's cooking uh, birds and animals, then he has to go to a hell where he gets boiled in oil. Another one where he's against the Sankirtan movement and tries to stop it, he goes to a hell where he gets sewn as though he's some, a piece of cloth. He gets sewn length and breadth with this thread. Um, can you imagine if you're sewn like that coming in and out? 
length and breadth. And another one, uh, one who forces his wife or beloved to drink his semina. He has to go to a planet where he's thrown into a river of semina and he has to drink that for years and years. There are other rivers that sinful persons get thrown into. Like uh, one is a river of pus, blood, stool, and urine. And he has to drink that for many, many, many years. And the reason for all that, another one, he has to become a worm. And he's thrown into a river full of worms. And he eats other worms, and other worms eat him. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing these various hells to Maharaj Parikit. Then after, he explains that after they get trained up because nobody likes to eat stool. But if you get trained long enough, then habit is the second nature, as they say. So then he gets put in, a, in an earthly body of, say, a dog or a pig, and then they love it by that time. So Sukadeva Goswami is explaining all these various hellish planets to Maharaj Parikit. And Maharaj Parikit, being a compassionate Vaishnava, he said, how can they get out of all these hells? How can the conditioned soul be delivered? So Sukadeva Goswami said, unless one uh, performs atonement, he engages in activities of atonement, he can never get delivered from these hellish situations and transmigrating through different species of life. Atonements like um, study of the Vedas, truthfulness, not speaking lies, um, being kind to others in the material sense, giving in charity, uh, cleanliness, these are uh, austerities, fasting, austerities to counteract the sinful reactions. Or um, gyan, cultivation of the knowledge that I'm not this body. So Prigat Maharaj said, well, but does that actually take away the desire for sin? So Sukadeva Goswami replied, Sinful activity is a fruit of activity. An atonement, oh, another atonement is controlling the mind and senses, not speaking uh, without consideration. Controlling the senses, not overeating. Controlling the anger. So Sukadeva Goswami replied that atonement can give temporary relief from the reactions of sinful activities. But still it's a fruit of activity, it's still it's a material activity. So it doesn't take away the desire. Even a very, very pious person, because he's controlled by the modes of nature, at any moment he can become sinful and then go to hell. So now, Sukadeva Goswami is saying, so now I'm going to give an example to show that the only way to permanently, forever, become free from the innumerable sinful activities that one has committed, both consciously and intentionally and unconsciously. For example, just walking to the store to buy food for myself I step on so many ants, I breathe so much bacteria, I turn on the faucet and kill so much bacteria in the water. Even that I have to suffer for. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Rodent spray, insect spray. So the only way, he said, to be free from the millions of births and this birth of sin is bhakti is having the association of a pure devotee and surrendering to him and following his instructions and chanting the holy name of the Lord. To give evidence of this, I, Sukadeva Goswami, 
I'm going to tell you a history that took place long ago. There was a Brahmana named Ajamya, and he was born in the province of Kanyakubja. He was a very pious Brahmana. His father trained him very nicely. He was in a very religious family, very pious. He worshipped the spiritual masters and the um, fire god for performing sacrifices, the family spiritual masters for performing sacrifices. I combined with things. The, the family spiritual masters and the fire god, and he performed fire sacrifices. He was very honest, very truthful, very benevolent, kind. He um, followed Vedic injunctions. He was respectful to elders. A perfect, pious brahmana. Then one day, <clears throat> when he was getting some fruits and flowers and summit, certain kind of grasses and kusha grass for performing a Vedic sacrifice, he happened to see <clears throat> on the path, a Sudra lady frivolously, frivolously embraced and embracing a drunken Sudra man. And they were joking and laughing and falling all over the place and her dress was falling and he was completely, his, his eyes and her eyes were all rolling in intoxication and Ajamil saw that and as in her intoxication she glanced over at Ajamil because when you're just glancing you don't know where you're glancing so with her lusty eyes she glanced over towards Ajamil and his heart was immediately impregnated by that lusty glance. So because he had such pious training from birth, he remembered the instructions of the Vedas, instructions of his gurus and his parents, and he said, this is all Maya, I'm not going to look again. I know that I'm not even supposed to look at a woman, or to speak of have um, attraction for her. But he couldn't help it. <laughs> so he became so absorbed in her, she completely took over his heart and he thought about her day and night. Finally, he just left his chaste wife, who was a, they're also a very pious, lovely Brahmani. He left his uh, old parents who were helpless without him and he went to live with the prostitute. This would be a good play. And um, he engaged in all kinds of abominable activities. He took on the job of, for his maintenance and her maintenance, of looting, stealing, um, plundering, arresting people, grabbing their money. And that's how he lived, to make her happy. And in the course of the years that went by, uh, they got 10 sons. And his youngest son, and he, you can imagine, he totally forgot everything that he learned from birth, from this bad association. So his youngest son was named Narayan. And naturally, one is attracted to the youngest son. So he was always thinking about him, always calling out his name, Narayan, Narayan. When he would chew and eat, he would call his son over to chew and eat with him, always playing together. So gradually, the years went on. And gradually, he became 81 years old, still doing all of his abominable activities. In having been totally influenced 
by the bad association of the lusty prostitute. So now, his death was coming. He was already getting old and he had such bad habits, so now death was coming. And he saw three very ghastly looking creatures. Very twisted, awkward, ugly. And they were coming with nooses to grab his soul, to bring it to hell. And he saw his little baby, his little child, Narayan, playing nearby. So he became overwhelmed with fear and anxiety, thinking and thinking that his son could save him. Because we get so much in illusion from bad association and giving up good association that he started screaming out, Narayan, Narayan, Narayan. Na, ra, ya, na. Four syllables. Because he was calling out these four syllables, though absorbed in his son, four very beautiful personalities appeared, carrying club, disc, lotus flower, and kancha. They had lotus eyes, beautiful golden ornaments, jewels, um, effulgent bodies, and they began to speak in a resounding voice to the constables of the god of death. Who are you that you are taking this person to be punished? You're supposed to be representatives of the god of death, Yamaraj, who's fully conversant with all religious principles. Don't you know who's supposed to be punished and who's not? Do you know what's religion and what's irreligion? So the Yamadutas replied, Who are you who has the audacity to try to stop us? You're very beautiful. You have lotus eyes and very beautiful bodies. It's obvious that you're sinless. But you should know that all these creatures in this material world, in all the planetary systems, are full of sin to three degrees, lots, little, and in between. So they have to get three corresponding results. And Sukadeva Goswami had previously told Maharaj Parikit that for these three kinds of sins, there are three kinds of atonements. Little atonement, big atonement, and in between. Like if you do a big crime, then you get a big punishment. You have to do a big atonement to counteract. And um, Maharaj Parikit had told Sukadeva Goswami, and Sukadeva Goswami was replying that somebody may hear about how terrible jail is, the suffering in jail. And he may uh, have seen people come out of jail, but still, because his senses are uncontrolled, they're, they're within the modes of nature, even if they're in the mode of goodness, they're still within the modes of nature. And in the material world, goodness is not pure. It's always mixed with some passion and ignorance. And the nature of the material world is that it, there's always a struggle for supremacy between the three modes of nature. Sometimes goodness may take over, sometimes passion, sometimes ignorance. So anyone who's in the modes of nature, even if he's in the modes of contaminated goodness, ignorance can take over at any time. So no matter what atonement he does, he can still fall down again. And even if he hears about the hells, because his senses are not out of the modes of nature, he'll still perform sinful activities and go there. And then after millions of births in hell, he'll come again to a human life and hear what he's been through. But because he's still under the modes of nature, because he hasn't fully taken charge, uh, shelter of a bona fide guru, 
he still commits uh, sins, just like Arjuna didn't want to at the beginning, but he was forced to, being controlled by the modes of nature because he was pious, always engaged in pious activities, but it wasn't enough to protect him. So now the Yamadutas are replying that, of course we know the principles of a religion. Narayan, he's manifested as the Vedas. Any religious activities which accord with the Vedas, that's religion. And whatever is against the Vedas, that's irreligion. So all these people in the material world are doing some kind of sin. They're doing pious activities, but they're also doing sinful activities at the same time. No one can do only pious activities. Even if one does everything pious consciously, then subconsciously or unconsciously he's doing impious things. And gradually impiety will take over. So why are you stopping us? So the Vishnu Dutas, in a very resounding voice, told them that really you have no idea what is religion. You think that he has not atoned from it for his sins. Actually, not only has he atoned for his sins in this life, but he's already atoned for his sins of millions of past lives. How? Because he's uttered the four syllables, Narayana. Even though he was intending to call his son, still, the Lord took it in a positive way. And he, therefore he was chanting inoffensively. There is ten kinds of offenses. And he wasn't committing any of them because he was just calling out in fear and anxiety. The ten offenses for all those who don't know it, especially who just got initiation recently, today, yesterday, day before, is to blaspheme devotees who dedicated their lives for propagating the holy name of the Lord, to consider the names as, of the demigods as equal to or independent of the name of Krishna, to uh, disobey the order of the spiritual master and consider him an ordinary man, thinking that he doesn't know what's best for me, but I do, and to, dis to uh, disobey the orders of scripture, to um, think that the chanting of the holy name is ordinary material piety, comparable with any other pious activity that would give me heavenly planets, to um, sin on the strength of chanting. Well, since chanting delivers one from all sin, I'll just sin and I'll keep chanting. No problem. But the name is not a machine. The name is a person. It's Krishna. And if Krishna sees that he's being misused, he doesn't have to stay there. If you see that you're being misused, would you stay with somebody? No. So the holy name also is not interested. So the holy name leaves. And that's the, the most strong of all the ten offenses. It's most offensive. And to um, not have complete faith in the chanting of the holy name. In spite of hearing so many instructions in the matter. And being on the bodily conception of life. Go chanting. These are ten offenses. So even if one is uh, doing the offenses, still he's gradually getting cleared. If he's at the same time begging that please stop me from these offenses. But if he's cultivating, especially Guru Aparat, even if he's chanting, going to Mangalartik, and everything like that, still, Gurudev said, because there were so many people who were not only against him for their in their own life, but were propagating everywhere in the world. Don't go to see Narayan, Maharaj, or Prabhupada will reject you and you'll go to hell. Um, so Gurudev said that even though there looks like they're chanting and they're looks like they're taking prasadam, looks like, but they are actually um, they're actually giving Krishna anxiety. What kind of anxiety? Krishna's thinking, oh my God, I've created so many hellish planets, but none 
that's hellish enough for this type of person. So how am I going to get one that's good enough? So Krishna is in anxiety like that. And when Gurudev first heard about what was happening back in 1996 on his first world tour, he was sitting at the airport on the chair in the lobby and he went like this and he said, they're cutting off their own thighs. But the um, Vishnu Dudas were telling the Yama Dudas he wasn't chanting with any offense. He was just an anxiety calling out to his son. So this was, uh, he was chanting, what do you call that? Namabas. And therefore, he's free from millions of births. He's atoned for millions of births. Because this is the nature of the holy name. It has so much power. And Sukadeva Goswami is trying to uh, impart to Maharaj Prigat the power of the holy name. So then, the Yamadudas were forced to release Ajanya. Well, first they told him the story. They said, we understand that he was pious at first, but then when he got in with this prostitute, he lost it all. So we have to punish him for that. So, but finally, because of the arguments of the Vishnu Dutas, who forcibly took away the ropes, they were not able to um, take his soul and bring it to hell. Oh, I forgot, another, another one of the hells is there's a planet made of hot, boiling, boiling hot copper. And they have to live on that boiling hot copper for thousands of years. No relief. So now, all this conversation between the Vishnu Dudas and the Yama Dudas were heard by Ajamyo. And he was completely struck with wonder because he'd been chanting the holy names of the Lord all these years. But now he understood the glory of the Lord by hearing from the pure Vaishnava, that is the Vishnu Dutas, who are gurus. All pure devotees are gurus automatically. All bona fide gurus are pure Vaishnavas. Now he had his moment's association with the pure devotee. So he immediately wanted to say something and offer his obeisances to the Vishnu Dutas. But seeing him wanting to say something, they immediately disappeared. So in the meantime, the Yama Dutas went to Yamaraj and said, what happened? We thought you're the supreme in judging who's pious and who's impious. Are there, is there anybody higher than you? So Yamaraj explained to them that all the demigods are under Lord Narayan, myself included, and they're under these pure devotees. Anybody who's chanting the holy names, even in joke, even neglectfully, you shouldn't even look at them or to speak of approach them. Because gradually, life after life, they'll get purified. They shouldn't go to hell. And Lord Narayan has made a vow that anyone who's chanting his holy name, or to speak of those who are chanting neglectfully, anybody who's chanting sincerely, his club will protect them from time, from enemies, from the envious, and even from me, even from my punishment. So this was the teaching of uh, Yamaraj to the Yamadutas. Where does religious principles come from? Dharma tu shakshat bhagavat pranitam. Religion was created by God himself. No one else can do it. And nobody understands the religious principles, but there are 12 authorities like Brahma, Shiva, Nard, and also myself, Bhishma, Janak, Prahlad, 12 great authorities, we also understand their religious principles. So yes, Ajamil is sinless now. He's not a pure devotee. Because as this conversation was going on, at the same time, 
Ajamyo, who was now purified by the association of the pure devotees. He, and they just disappeared. He began to think. His whole thinking changed by their association. Oh, fie on me! What did I do? I've left my chaste wife, my elderly parents who could not live without me. I left them in that condition without any consideration. I stayed with a lowly, lusty prostitute, had children with her, hurt so many people, plundering them, beating them, stealing, just to satisfy her lusty senses. Oh, I should be burnt in many millions of hells. But these pure devotees, they've saved me, they've shown me the light. I'm never again going to fall prey of my senses. I'm going to Hardwar, to the bank of the Ganges, and there I'm going to perform Bhakti Yoga, because I know no other austerities or atonement or pious activities will help me. I'm going to meditate on the Supreme Lord in Bhakti Yoga, and so he went by foot to Hardwar, and for many years he was meditating on the form of the Lord. He became so purified that seeing how purified he was, because pure devotees, they're in the hearts of everyone. As you might have heard a few days ago in the history of Narada, when Narada came to see um, Vyasadeva to order him to write the Srimad Bhagavatam in trance, when he first came, Vyasadeva told him, that you are just like the air. The air can enter into the inner regions of everyone and everything. So you're just like the super soul. So you know my heart, you know what's my dissatisfaction. Similarly, when Sutta Goswami was about to recite the Srimad Bhagavatam, he first offered his prayers to Sukadeva Goswami, his spiritual master, to get strength from him to preach, to teach Srimad Bhagavatam. And in that, the prayers to his Gurudev, Sukadeva Goswami, he said, he sang, Yam pravarjanta manapetam apetu kvityam dvaipayano vyas dvaipayano Huh? Viraha Katamam Ajuhava Putre di Tanmaya Taya Taruvo Banedus Tang Sarva Buddha Vridayam Muni Manatos Me Tang Sarva Buddha Vridayam My Gurudev Sukadeva Goswami is situated in the hearts of all. He knows everyone's hearts, their happinesses, their distresses. Everyone is looking for someone who can know how nice I am and who will also know the volume of my suffering. And that can only be Krishna, situated in our heart, and Guru, who is Krishna's manifestation, who is also externally and also situated in our heart. Only he knows the volume of our suffering and only he knows all of our uh, goodness, and he can bring out that goodness to its perfection. So, uh, the Vishnu Dutas knew now he's ready for going to Vaikuntha. So they immediately appeared with a golden airplane, not material gold, but spiritual gold. And um, Ajamil said to them, he fell down at their feet, weeping in ecstasy. And he said, how come when you appeared before and you were having this conversation with the Yamadutas, I wanted to talk with you, bow down to you, but you just disappeared. And now you're actually taking me and I'm able to speak with you. What happened? What's the difference? And they said, you weren't pure enough. You were just beginning. So we couldn't give you our full association at the time. But now, by our mercy, 
You've become pure, and now we're taking you with us to be eternal associates. So, this is the power of the association of pure devotees. This is the power of taking the holy name. This is the power of giving the holy name. Because Sri Guru has come to take all the wilted flowers of spirit souls all over the world and make them blossom beautifully so that he can offer them to Radha and Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan. And when he sees any of his followers doing that assistance for him, then he becomes so pleased. And this play that you did last night, this drama, is also that very important preaching. And that, which is very interesting because, you know, for the most part, during this whole festival, like of all the festivals in the West that I've ever been to, Gurudev spoke the least here. But I think you all felt that his eyes were the most piercing and penetrating, and his penance, the presence, was the most penetrating and piercing that you might have experienced. So deep, like you feel like I'm totally exposed. So that, that's good, I'm totally exposed. He's in the middle of doing an operation and he's doing all kinds of things in there, exposing me and then moving everything around, putting all the good stuff in, taking the bad stuff. So the thing is that although we were speaking, I was speaking, other speakers were speaking, um, we weren't giving her a Please forgive me any of the sannyasis if I'm wrong. Uh, but Harikata can only be given by the uh, Uttama Mahabhagwa. We can give, well, I don't mean to say that I'm wrong, I mean to say that if any of you are pure devotees like that, please forgive me. But um, we can give, we conditioned souls can give information about Harikata. And Harikata, the Shabda Brahma, that comes from the lips of the pure devotee. Why? Because Hari has manifested in his heart and is coming out of his lips. He's not in control of what he's saying. Hari is in control and he's fully absorbed in Hari. And Hari has taken over and come in the form of Kata because Gurudev is actually the Ashraya manifestation of Hari, isn't he? Shakshad Haritva. So, um, there are three kinds of preachers or teachers. One who gives information about Harikata, in other words, words. Even if I speak about Krishna, it's still not Shabda Brahma. It's still Samanya Brahma. I mean, not Samanya Brahma, it's still uh, Shabda Samanya, <laughs> ordinary sound. But when a pure devotee speaks, it's Shabda Brahma. From his pores of his body, prey atoms are coming and falling on the audience. And from his glance, Shabda Brahma is coming. Transcendental sound of life. So actually, he was giving the Harikata the whole time. He was giving you all Harikata. So by the mercy of the Harikata of the Vishnu Dutas, Ajanil was able to achieve Vaikuntha. Then what to speak of? We're getting so much association with the books, um, TV, um, Pure Bhakti TV, um, purebhakti.com, and Gurudev's constantly traveling around the world and giving classes all the time at his advanced age of 88. And he's giving much more than, he's offering much more than Ajamil could ever even imagine. Uh, what is that in the fourth verse of um, Manashiksha? Api Tyatva Lakshmi Patiratimna Nayam Vyoma, something like that. And mind, you should also give, give up attachment to Lakshmi Pati Narayan, which leads to Vaikuntha. 
So if so much greatness is coming to Ajamyo, what to speak of anybody who's in connected with Srila Gurudev? So regarding the operations that he does, I'll tell one incident, a very interesting operation. Uh, Ramanuja Acharya had one disciple who was a very great scholar. He knew all the Vedas. He could quote any verse from any Vedic literature. And he knew it, and he was proud of it. So Ramanuja Acharya was thinking, such a good po potential, but he's ruining it with his false pride. So I should do an operation. So around that same time, one of his uh, young lady disciples, who had been with him since she was a little girl and used to jump on his lap, now she was married. And she came to him and said, Oh, Lord, please help me. I need a servant. My husband's relatives are so nasty. Even though I've come from a very rich home, they treat me just like garbage. They treat me just like I'm some slave. I have to walk miles to the well up a hill every day to get water for washing, for cooking, for cleaning. I have to cook for the whole family, not only my husband, but all of his relatives. Every day I have to wash everybody's clothes, I have to get the water from the well, and I just can't do it. I need a servant. I told them that I, I want to get help and they wouldn't even let me get any help. So Gurudev, please give me a servant. So Sri Ramanujacharya called for that scholar disciple and he said, I want you to go and serve my girl disciple. Become her servant and whatever she asks you to do, do. So, yes, Gurudev. Gurudev said, if I gave that, that order to any of you, you'd say, what is this bogus guru? And you'd send out emails on the internet to everybody. Don't go to that bogus guru who just mess up your life. So this disciple went to the place of the girl, serving, doing everything, washing, cleaning, cooking. They wouldn't even give him soap to clean himself. So he was like...